Stone, June Lee. I told you guys, it's ramp up season. Danny Hurley, earlier this week, Brad Underwood last night. If you're not in the ramp, you get on the ramp. Also, Momo, you might need uh, to ramp up to a six inch wedge if you're standing next to Liz Cam Beige again. Let's go. Those are three inch wedges. <laughs> Those are three, three inch Stella McCartney's, yeah. right? I don't know. Oh, man. Woo. James Harden, Philadelphia 76ers debut tonight versus Minnesota. Joel Embiid talked to reporters today at Shoot Around. He doesn't do that often. He said he expects things to go smoothly. Doc Rivers talking to reporters saying it's like speed dating. They got to ramp up quickly. Ramona <laughs> Shelburne around the horde to you. Expectations tonight for Harden and Embiid together and things you're interested in seeing. Well, the last time uh, James Harden debuted for a new team was actually just last year. Yes. And he had a triple-double when he <laughs> debuted for the Nets. So he tends to do pretty well in these debuts. He's supposedly really in really good shape right now. He ramped up really hard in practice. He and Joel are getting along famously. I, I, my question <laughs> is for Minnesota and for the rest of the league, who do you double? Okay, mm -hmm. I, mean, I guess I'd probably take my chances with Carl Towns on Joel Embiid, but Joel Embiid's your MVP front runner. You're going to put two on hard. This is going to be a matchup nightmare for every team that plays him. I know it's going to be change. It's going to be strange because Harden's going to have to do some pick, pick and pops and with Embiid and instead of the pick and roll, he's going to have to he's going to have to shoot three pointers, catch and shoot instead of just his step back. He's only averaged one catch and shoot per game mm. for his career, but it's a good problem to have. J.A. Adonde, expectations tonight for Harden and Embiid and the Sixers with their new look? Not much for tonight, but I think they will be able to get it together pretty quickly. And people wonder about the fit and, and the ball control and all that. Well, Joel Embiid, for as dominant he's been, the focal point of that offense, he only has the ball three seconds per touch, which is about mm. half the time that, that James Harden has it. James Harden leads the league in time possessing the ball, nine minutes per game, triple what Hart, what Embiid has. So it's really, you know, the numbers can actually work. Embiid doesn't need the ball that much of the time. The question is, yeah. what is he going to do in Doc Rivers' system? Remember, he thrived in Houston with Mike D'Antoni. Mike D'Antoni was an assistant coach with the Brooklyn Nets when Harden got there last season, and Harden had another MVP consideration type season. New system, different coach, a coach who's never had a player quite like Harden at the point guard. How is that going to work is the big question for me. Mm. Kevin Blackstone, Harden and Bead in the Sixers first look tonight. Well, it's a soft rollout um, against the Timberwolves. Mm. Uh, you know, the last that we saw, the last that we saw Harden, you know, he's basically a 22, 10, and 8 guy per night. Um, I suspect he'll be close to those uh, numbers tonight. But it, to what um, J.A. was saying, you know, it's really going to be hard to judge Everything about James Harden in just one game, we're really talking about what this means down the road and what this means going into the playoffs. And the question is, is what does this mean for Embiid, who's having an MVP year? Does James Harden come in and disrupt that, or does he come in and fit in? We talked about him coming off of the best team that never was, the Brooklyn Nets, for whatever reasons, did not fit in there, um, did not work out in Houston. Maybe it was just because of that, that one injury. But we're always waiting for him to make that next step, and he hasn't made it yet. So how will he do it with this team? I'm not sure. Jun Lee. I'm not as convinced as Ramona and J.A.R. that the fit works because over the course of the last nine seasons, James Harden leads the NBA with 12.4 ISOs per game. And in this season, Joel Embiid is averaging 10.1 post-ups per game, uh, tops in the NBA as well. Uh, James Harden's going to have to put his ego aside and be willing to give Joel Embiid the ball more because Embiid having the ball in his hands has made the Sixers offense way more dynamic than it has been in the past. Uh, and this is the first time in James Harden's career that he's had to play next to a player who is demonstrably better than him, but is also very, very that? ball dominant. Yeah, I'm a little bit confused but also, here. I mean, the but guy's it, among but the is, league but leaders. But also and... very ball dominant. Right. And, <laughs> and, but he's, he's led the league in assists before. It's not like he doesn't give up the ball, dude. <laughs> Yeah, but I, I also I, I also don't think that his assists are necessarily, you know, I, I think assists can sometimes be a deceiving mm -hmm. okay. number and whether or not you're creating shots for, for your teammates. I'll allow that. Adane, back in after the horn. It's considered motive. It's not like Harden has made these last two moves to pad his stats. He's done it so that he can have an opportunity to win. He needs an opportunity to win. I was thinking during the top 75, how many players like James Harden have never started for a team in the NBA Finals. James Harden is still missing that on his resume, and that's, that really sets him apart from the rest of the players in the top 75. 
We'll see what happens tonight. Boston 129, Brooklyn 106 last night. The Jason Tatum detonation. <laughs> Brooklyn has 22 games left in their season. They are two losses away from being out of the play-in right now. Ramp-ups, mandates, injuries. J.A. Donde, how patient can the Nets afford to be seeing the team you saw last night get drilled? They can't be patient. They also can't be expecting, okay, it'll all immediately get better once they do get everybody back, even if they get Kyrie for home games. Is he going to help their defense that much? Ben Simmons will help. Will Joe Harris help? Will Kevin Durant help that much if they come back on defense? They gave up 97 points through the first three quarters last night. And, yes, maybe having better offensive players – does mitigate that a little bit, right? You, you can't run fast breaks if you're taking the ball out of the net. But still, I'm concerned that the defense won't be there, and defense is where you really need the time to come together and communicate. They don't have the time. They don't necessarily have the personnel to get that much better to a championship level defensively. Ramona, the team that lost last night is not the team that you're going to be seeing in the playoffs, the Nets hope, but how much time do they have? Not much. I mean, usually when we have the All-Star break and the traditional schedule, it's like halfway through the year, maybe 60% through the year. This is like 75% through the season. There's not much time left. Kevin Durant's probably going to come back early next week, so he'll, he will help. Ben Simmons maybe next week, the week after, okay. he, he will help as well, especially defensively. But they're running out of real estate, and I know – I know that we just saw the Boston Celtics go from a team that looked like they weren't even going to make the playoffs three weeks ago to a team that could win it all with how well they're mm. playing. So you can change it pretty quickly in this league. But I just don't know that they have enough time. They're, they're three and a half out of sixth place. Sixth place is not in the playoff, in the play in tournament. That's, that's a lot of ground to make up with just six or seven weeks left in the year. Jun Lee. I mean, the Celtics also haven't even trailed for one second over the course of the last five row games. I think I'm right. more convinced wow. that KD, KD is able to kind of bring up the Nets over the course of the last couple of weeks. Like, I think KD could bring the real Grandy Valley Vipers of the G League to a conference finals, given how talented he is. If you have Kevin Durant on your team, I think you're going to be in a position to fight for a championship. I think Kyrie Irving, KD, and Ben Simmons has a much better fit than the Sixers do with Embiid and Harden. Uh, and they're also in a position where, you know, the Celtics, Celtics obviously have been on a, on a hot streak over the course of the last couple weeks, but they've been playing some opponents that have been hobbled. So I think the win streak is slightly deceiving mm -hmm. okay. in terms of kind of the, the level of play that the Celtics were bringing into last Kevin, night. Kevin, how much time do the Nets have to ramp up here? None. I mean, <laughs> just as Ramona just said, <laughs> no, they got to go. They got to go right now. You're talking about the eighth team in the East. That's what you're talking about. A few more losses and they could be relegated. Um, this is this is trouble time for them. And we all know that it's Kevin Durant who stirs that team. And he's got to come back. We just assume that he's going to be healthy and just be able to turn it on, just flip the switch. That's what we're expecting about this team. But back to June's point, you know, we're talking about a team here that's been struggling rather than talking about a team like the Celtics who've won 10 of their last 11 mm -hmm. and basically since the holidays have been the best defense in the okay. NBA and you know they've got offense to go um, to go along with that so I'm paying more attention to the teams with an arrow going up than a team with a with no arrow at all Ramona you did say you're hearing Durant back early next week yeah he I think he's coming back early next week and and the problem is, though, if he comes back, he's going to want to play a lot of minutes. Like, you're going to have to rein Kevin Durant in because he's been sitting here watching them lose yeah. and lose Understood. all this ground. But that's why you have a coach. <laughs> that is – there <laughs> lies Steve Nash's job. We've been – we're going to move on. I heard some things earlier in the show about yeah. MVP and the front runner for the MVP. Well, let me put you to the test right now. Chicago last night. DeMar DeRozan doing it again. Led the Bulls back against Atlanta in the last minute. Scoring just about every point. He finished with 37. So his NBA record since he's already passed Wilt. Now at eight straight games, 35 plus points, 50% plus shooting. The best MVP race in memory. Jokic, Giannis, Embiid, who I think two panelists already just gave the award to. But only one guy is on the one seed right now in the East. Jay, could DeMar DeRozan have the best claim to most valuable this season? Absolutely, and maybe the longest claim. I mean, if you've been watching and paying attention, I thought he staked a claim to the MVP very early on, and certainly when he hit those back-to-back -back buzzer beaters. But Tony goes beyond MVP for this season. It really has to make us reconsider what we're watching in the historical context. You know, this run that he's been on has been matched only by 
six other guys, all most of them one name guys: LeBron, Wilt, Michael, Kobe, Elgin, Ooh. James Harden. That's the group of elite scorers. There's that word, yes, but uh -oh. elite scoring uh -oh. level that he's shown, and it's not just this year. As the Athletic showed, as the Athletic said. He's actually been the top isolation scorer in the NBA for the past three seasons. Okay. So we need to think about DeMar's place. Adande grinding through that bad scoring. word, but you had the points to give up. You're moving like a tremendous machine, Adande. <laughs> uh, Ramona, I know you just said Embiid and front runner, but has anybody elevated a team this season? Chicago's the one seed, Ramona, like DeRozan has. Should I risk the band word? Should I risk it? I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm going to risk it. I'm going to risk it. Okay, Joel Embiid has had the name. Oh, no. She oh, did it. Oh, oh, no. I didn't need to do that. He has. He has been. Yeah, he has because he, Ben Simmons has not been there. He's carried Philadelphia through the wilderness there. James Harden is joining the team now, though. Does he lose that same edge he had in terms of how valuable he has been when you add a former MVP to your team? Mm -hmm. DeMar DeRozan is on a team that is currently first in the East. That changes every day. It's like Tuesday, Wednesday. It's a different team in the East is first. But he is changing He's he's changing our view also of the mid-range game. This man is getting 7.2 7 two-pointers outside the restricted yeah. area a game and shooting 50%. You know who's done that? Michael Jordan in 2001. And he shot 40% on those twos. I mean, this is – this is I have not seen a season like this in a long time. Oh, it time. sounds like he's making your ballot at the very least, and you still have some Definitely. time to play with June Lee. How about you? I mean, Ramona points out everything that DeRozan has done on the court to elevate the Bulls in their offense, but he's also setting the tone off the court as well. Mir and Fader of the Ringer had an incredible feature on DeRozan about how he's kind of grown as a person over the course of the last couple of years since talking about his anxiety and his depression. And I think he's really set the tone for this team. And, you know, you look at the depth up and down that Bulls roster, you see Javante Green, who's a spark plug on both ends of the ball for the Chicago Bulls. Io Dosenmu has been one of the most surprising rookies, has been a lockdown defender for that mm. team with the course the last couple of weeks like this is a team that a lot of people have been kind of scared of talking about as a maybe contender but I think you really have to watch out for them especially once Lonzo Ball and Alex Caruso come June, in. bullish on the Bulls but did you answer the question is DeRozan the MVP June <laughs> he needs to be in the conversation oh Absolutely. no I can't oh, believe you just did that black is the last on this <laughs> well, let me just say this. On this run that the Bulls are on, that DeMar DeRozan is fueling, he has done it in part without Ball. He has mm -hmm. done it in part without Zach Levine. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is the measure of an MVP to fill in for guys who are not there. And as Tony, you just said, he has elevated this team to a height this year that none of us expected to see. So absolutely. We've been Horn taking a break right here. Donde in the lead, Blackstone. And then the two bad word users, Shelburne and Lee, back by or sell in two minutes. Kyler Murray and the Arizona Cardinals, the latest. Everything is copacetic. NFL Network's Jane Slater. There's now a Cardinals image on Murray's social media page. So the, the two are uh, reportedly working to exercise the fifth-year option or agree to terms on a long-term deal, Slater reports as well. Jay, buy or sell, they're on the same page moving forward. Uh, isn't this the same network that earlier reported that the Cardinals were none too pleased with Kyler's lack of maturity? So, uh, yes, this happens all the time where two different reporters from the same outlet report different things. When the NFL Network reports that he's actually signed the contract extension, then I'll believe that everything's okay. Kevin Blackstone. Man, it better be copacetic. This is a no-brainer. What are you talking about? You moved heaven and earth to get this guy for the coach that you have. He's been, he's gotten better every year. He's a Pro Bowl quarterback. He's your future. And if you just look around the league, what gets you to a Super Bowl? What makes you a playoff contender? The quarterback. You got one. Sign in. But, Kevin, if I could follow up, what did you read into the report that Don they just alluded to that people thought he was immature or his reactions on the sidelines? Just, I just I chalked that up to silly social media. Well, okay, social media wasn't happening uh, on the sidelines after interceptions, though. I, I just think I think you're reading way too much into mm -hmm. it. I, I mean, I think, I, I think, you know, it's between him and the coach, and I think that they will work Drew it out. Drew and Lee, bring you in here. 
Well, if that sentiment is reigning inside of the Cardinals organization, you have to make sure that it's not leaking out to the media, especially when you have a franchise quarterback as talented as Kyler Murray. Yes, Kyler Murray, I think, has made some mistakes in how he's handled the situation in terms of his maturity, uh, but this is still a guy who, you know, in a league where Kirk Cousins is making $30 million a year, is an incredibly valuable person to have in your organization, and you have to make sure you can't, you can't mess up that relationship. Bonus show, bro. You know, a wise person once told me that people uh, don't, can't, don't tell you how they feel. They show, show you. you how they feel with money, okay? <laughs> if they offer it, he's not, it's going to be fun, <laughs> okay? Okay, I'm following what you're putting out. You'll wait until there's a new extension or a contract. Here, here's my point, and this is, applies to the next story we're about to do. These franchises have young investment, young players that they should think the world of, and they should be doing everything in their power to reach their full potential, which is my question about the New Orleans Pelicans. Buy or sell two, here's CJ McCollum. Leave the young fella alone. Leave the young fella alone. He's talking at Pelicans practice yesterday, telling reporters he has since talked to Zion Williamson after mentioning in an interview with TNT last week, he hadn't talked to Zion Williamson. He's trying to rehab in peace. McCollum also said, you guys put him on the spot daily. McCollum also said, and you guys are making it a distraction. McCollum also said, but Ramona, it's a fact that Zion is away from the team. It's a fact that there is very little visibility into the relationship between Zion and the team and vice versa. How do you consider it all? You know who could clear this up? Zion Williamson. <laughs> okay. okay. I mean, just speak for yourself. Like, it, th this is what we always say to get somebody to talk to us in a story. If you don't tell your story, somebody else will. And now, because Zion doesn't really tell his side of the story or tell, tell people how he really feels, and he's off in Portland doing his own thing away from the team, you're left for other people to tell your story. And I, it's sad that this is how this has been going. Jay Adonde. It's a great sign of leadership by CJ McCollum, but he's only been in New Orleans long enough to grab a couple beignets. And yes, Zion should be the one taking the leadership reins, should be the one speaking here. So it's bad that the new guy is instantly the vocal face of the franchise. Kevin, is this all on Zion, a 21-year-old, or is part of it also on the team for even getting to this situation? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's part on the team getting to this situation and not realizing what a precarious situation you are in as the New Orleans Pelicans. Remember, this is a team that's been in the playoffs and had a winning season, what, twice in the last 10 years. CJ McCollum just came there from a playoff pretender out west, and he's looking around, and the cupboard is almost bare without a guy like Zion Williams. And so, of course, he wants him to be comfortable and play Julie. beside him. I mean, we've been talking about the next Ben Simmons situation with the Sixers, and I think it's right in front of us here with Zion Williamson. He's not talking. Obviously, the relationship between the two organizations has been starting to fray, but Zion is in a position right now where he came into the league as an incredibly famous, very powerful young basketball player, and he he's trying to figure out kind of how to manage the situation best possible for his future. Obviously, he doesn't want to invest in this team, uh, but this is going to continue happening as we see more and more guys who are famous before they even get to the NBA start to get gain power uh, in their positions as stars uh, in basketball. Accepting all that, fair representation. We're still talking about a 21-year-old here. I mean, and Kyler Murray's case, slightly older. To navigate all this is tough for anybody. Should it be, be on the team and behoove the franchise to escort a young player through this? You want... <laughs>